Ask Map to episode 131. I am joined. I'm I'm Dr. Ryan Gray. I'm joined by uh, Rachel Grubbs, co-founder at Mapped MCAT Test Prep Extraordinaire. Been in the pre-med world for 20 years or so. Uh, a few a few years. Um, no old friends. How how you doing, Rachel? I'm good. I uh, I like being in my 40s. I'm not at all embarrassed to say I have 20 years of experience because <laughs> honestly, I feel like. As a kid, I could not see life beyond 30, and now mm-hmm. I'm here to say every decade gets better. Aging yeah. is pretty great. I, I had a, a thought yesterday. I don't know if you guys watch Yellowstone at all, mm-hmm. um, but there there are flashbacks to a, a younger John Dutton, the the head of the, the household. And I was just thinking yesterday, I'm like, these flashbacks to when he's younger and in this like other time, I'm like that's probably like 1990. <laughs> These flashbacks aren't that long ago uh, in the grand scheme of things. And I was just, I was cracking up thinking about that last night. I'm like, oh, I'm getting old. I'm getting yeah. old. That's okay. Yeah. That's yeah. right. <laughs> Brittany Granham also here today. Uh, a former assistant dean in pre health and STEM advising at Hofstra University. How are you? Yes, I'm doing great. Thank you. Uh, I too have over 20 years of experience <laughs> and I'm happy to say that uh, I'm proud of that fact too. So happy new year, everyone. Glad to be here. Looking forward to helping out some more students today. Yeah. Um, if you are watching on Instagram, go over to premed.tv. That is our medical school HQ premed channel. Ask your questions over there. We'll, uh, we'll help you out. All right, let's rock and roll. So we're here to answer your questions. Go over there, ask them, and we'll uh, we'll get started. JB asks, I'm thinking about applying DO in 23. What are the core differences between it and MD in experiences I should consider before applying? I love, uh, I know shadowing a DO is important. Anything else? JB it's the same. <laughs> there's, no, there's no difference. Yeah, <laughs> Vernia, can you can you? What, are there differences uh, between the two? No, I mean that there's the whole idea of getting the additional training of um, OMM and osteopathic manipulative. I forget what it stands for. OMM manipulative uh, os- medicine. Yep. Thank you. Um, yeah, but no, terms, no, before applying as a pre med, yeah. what experiences should right. you be getting? In terms of that, there's no difference. Just continue to um, observe, observe, you know, how doctors work in their everyday lives, MD or DO, they're doing the same thing. Um, and consider, you know, are there, talk to the doctors maybe that you are around and see if there are any differences between the two that they maybe think of um, yep. or that they maybe have insight to. But other than that, no continue doing what you're doing and good luck good luck yeah so e- even shadowing a do is kind of a mm. a big myth out there that you have to shadow a do to apply to do schools and there's one school arkansas college of osteopathic medicine that um i think it's the last holdout for still requiring a, a do letter specifically a letter of recommendation so mm-hmm. yeah no differences yep Karen, what are the chances of a potential MD or DO, so a potential interview, med school interview, invite in January through March? Thanks, Rachel. The, the medical school application timeline is, is very long. Interview invites can still go out, but it's getting less and less, yeah? Yeah. I mean, so the the short answer, Karen, is it depends. Um I don't think you should give up hope. If you've if you've applied this cycle, you should keep hoping because people do get interviews in January, February, March. Um, some schools do rounds of interviews and they plan on a January round. Some schools sort of focus on fall rounds and then they do winter, spring interviews as needed based on how the fall rounds go. Um, DO schools in particular tend to do, it's a little bit more common for them to do um, winter spring interviews um but but md still happen um so what are the chances uh between zero and a hundred 
<laughs> right? I, I don't have a number for you because again, it's gonna depend school to school, year to year, mm -hmm. committee to committee. Um, typically what we say this time of year, and this is something we've been saying since kind of late November, early December is this is the time of year that you should continue to hope for the current cycle, but also do some deep reflection and think about if I did have to reapply in May, what could I be doing now to strengthen my application? So it's very much a hope for the best, prepare for the worst kind of moment in time. The other thing to think about, and I did a, a video about this recently because I, I saw a question, I think it was on Reddit, I saw the question, is oftentimes interviews that are later in the cycle are for waitlist spots. Mm -hmm. The class is theoretically full meaning they have 100 seats, 100 students have put down deposits on those seats. And yet historically, the school knows that some of those people, students that have put down deposits, will ultimately go to another school because they were accepted at another school that they'd rather go to. And they have to pull students off of the wait list to fill the class back up to 100. And so it's, it's this kind of, leaky bucket kind of thing that's happening is students are saying yes i'm coming and then at some point later saying haha just kidding i'm going to a better school a different school better better for me uh school and the wait list is constantly being um pulled uh dipped into and the school knows i need this big of a wait list so they're not only trying to fill a class they're also trying to fill a wait list and interviews that are happening later in the cycle theoretically can be for a wait list. And so I don't want that to let you uh, get you down because the wait list spots are still very important to interview, very important spots to get uh, because the school knows based on historical numbers that, hey, X percentage of our wait list is going to get an offer from us at some point. And so we want that wait list full. We want the best people on the wait list. And so if you hear through the grapevines or if the school puts it out that says, hey, our class is full and would you like an interview? You, you say yes to the interview. You go as if you are still uh, uh, interviewing for a spot at that med school. Definitely. San, do you recommend getting a recommendation letter from a doctor for MD? Not really sure I understand. Is the question, should you get a letter of recommendation from a physician if you're applying to medical school? Is that the question? Maybe. Do you guys know? Uh, maybe. I think so. Yeah, it's, it's, the context is tough. Son, why don't you try again? We'll come back to you if you can reword it in a clearer way. Wesley asks, as a non-traditional student who works full-time and cannot stop, can't stop, won't stop, uh, will taking one or maybe two classes per semester to get my prereqs done show academic rigor? Verinia, this comes up a bunch. Uh, medical mm -hmm. schools not only want to see that your grades are good enough, but your mm -hmm. grades are good enough in a specific um, setting, so to mm -hmm. speak, uh, to, to make sure that you're going to do well in medical school. Um, and so there's yeah. potential concern here, right? These onesie, twosie classes, is yeah. that going to be enough? What are your thoughts there? Yeah, I agree. I think it is potentially concerning. Um, but as Wesley mentions, you know, you can't stop, won't stop working. Um, it is what it is. Um, I think you just focus on what you can do right now. Maybe one semester down the road, you can take an extra class or maybe um, do something to kind of continue to show that you can do well, even if you take on more classes. Um, but I've worked with postbacs in the past that had sa same situation or they only needed to take one or two classes for whatever the reasons were. And it wasn't so much of an issue. Um, I think it's just, you know, it, it might depend on the school. Uh, it depends on your history as well. What's been your uh, academic um, uh, record so far? Have you performed poorly when you took, you know, a large number, uh, a big number of credits in the past? So there's a lot of things to consider here. Um, but assuming work is not an option to quit, like you mentioned, then just, you know, keep going, keep doing what you're doing. And if you can in the future, try to add another another class. 
Yeah. At, at the end of the day, the, the question ultimately, Wesley, is you've already said you can't stop working. Mm -hmm. And so if that's all you can do, mm -hmm. what's the point of the question to begin with? Right. It's like you if your situation isn't going to change, you can't change it, you won't change it, and you can only do one or two classes a semester for your prereqs. And we tell you, oh, that's not good enough. Are you gonna go, okay, great, I'm not gonna apply to medical school. I'll go do something else. Right. So to me, the question is like you if if your situation isn't going to change, then the question doesn't help. Right. Yeah, I agree with that. To put it another way, uh, unless you personally think it's a deal breaker, just keep on keeping on. Keep on keeping on. You're not hearing deal breaker from us. Yep. Yeah. <laughs> exactly. Uh, before we jump into this uh, money mo, uh, tonight, if you go to premedworkshop.com slash interviews, premed.com slash uh, premedworkshop.com slash interviews. Um, I'm doing a workshop tonight all about the interview process and mistakes that students make. I'm doing the same. Uh, that's at nine Eastern tonight. I'm doing the same workshop tomorrow. If you can't make it tonight, uh, the exact same workshop tomorrow at 1 p.m. Eastern, I believe. Um, so go go there and yeah, go sign up, especially if you're applying this cycle. All right, money mo, mo money, mo problems. Thousand hours of research in neuroscience and mechanical engineering, but no publications in two years. You are a failure, money mo. Is this a red flag for research powerhouse medical schools? No. Publications are not the goal of research. Research is the goal of research. Mm -hmm. Yeah, not a problem at all. There's this big... Uh, it's it's a fetish almost at this point of of research. Rachel's like, yeah, that's exactly the way to put it. The, the it, research and publications are fetishized uh, amongst pre meds. Of like, I have to have research. I have to have publications. If I don't have publications, if I want to go to a research powerhouse medical school, I'm not going to get in. Like, no, that is not true. So, but uh, it's it's also like the previous question, right? If you you know, even if you were worried about this, do you not continue and apply? I mean, you have a thousand hours of research experience, so right, don't yeah. worry about it. They should just lower their sights and and go yeah. to a non research yeah. powerhouse medical school, whatever that means. Yeah. Uh, th and that's all just built off of the the stupid U.S. News and World Reports list, anyway. Mm -hmm. The because they separate research institutions and uh, primary care mm -hmm. institutions, I think is is how they designate med school so yeah. it's all bs at the end of the day yeah well and even then there are many med schools that talk in detail about research in terms of oops someone did it for me thanks um what they expect from their faculty and med students but if you go to the admissions requirements page has zero mention of research so just keep in mind that just because the faculty are expected to do it doesn't mean that they expect pre-meds to do it um yeah. So, I mean, if research is your passion, follow your passion. That's great. Um, I'm not, I'm not anti-research. I'm anti-research as a way of thinking you're being busy and checking boxes when you should be getting clinical. Um, I still talk to, I mean, we've been doing this for a long time and trying to spread this message for a long time. And, you know, at least once a week, I talk to a student who has a ton of research and no clinical and doesn't know that's a problem. And that, that's what makes me nervous is pre-meds are so busy. And if you're prioritizing your time that way, to me, that sends a message that you want to get a PhD in science, not be a clinician. Yeah. And if they had a mapped account, we could use our insight tool to, to let them know, hey, this is a problem. Yeah. Well, mapped account users tend not to be the ones who are coming to me with that issue. <laughs> <laughs> Did you know, know <laughs> friends, that a mapped account is free? Oh. Free. Mapped.com. Map.com, indeed. Yeah. Yes, Gotta we do have a 
pro is. level account. Um, if you want access to us as advisors, if you want access to our new My LORs feature, which will be rolling out here in the next few weeks for students to start collecting, uh, requesting, collecting, storing, and transmitting letters of recommendations to their uh, to to medical schools and stuff to to their application services, all of that will be included in Mapped Pro as well. It's only seven fifty a month when you when you buy the annual the annual plan. So it's a good deal. Very good. Mm -hmm. All right, Sam Gas, my undergrad GPA was a three and then I did a one year SMP and got a three eight seven. Congrats! But this GPA counts as graduate GPA, not undergraduate GPA. Will my low undergraduate GPA still hold me back? Will I need to retake undergraduate classes? So this is one of those big fat, it's going to depend on the medical school. Uh, unfortunately, there are medical schools that will want to see a better undergraduate GPA. And there are medical schools that will look at that SMP and go, yeah, you crushed it. Great job. We don't really care as much about your undergraduate GPA. Uh, I, I've seen students with 2.7s uh, get really great SMP grades and have no problem getting into some schools. So uh, uh, unfortunately, Rachel, this is a situation I think where they they shouldn't reach out. Maybe, maybe they should reach out to some schools and go, hey, like, are you going to look at my SMP? Or are you just going to think about my undergraduate GPA? Yeah, I mean, that level of detail is often not listed on school websites. I would still start with school websites. I mean, again, this, these are things we repeat. They're, these are evergreen truths. When in doubt, Google it and look for the school's firsthand information before you call or email. Um, because uh, while those offices are happy to help, they don't want to tell you things you could have just read on your own if you'd taken a few minutes on the internet. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, this is this is just going to be a question mark. And it, it might be that if you email and ask, they say, we weighed it uh, multiple different ways and we can't tell you. Because it mm -hmm. might depend on how the other people applying did, right? They might, mm -hmm. you know, it, it, it might be that you really bring something to the table that rounds out their, I often think of med school cohorts as like an orchestra, right? They want a bunch of different instruments to make that full sound. So maybe there's something not quantifiable that you bring to the table that makes them say, even though typically we don't like undergraduate GPAs below 3.0, you know, he sh you did a year SMP, I don't know how many credits that is. I mean, I know SMPs are really rigorous because they're often very similar to first year med schools, but you know, it, I, I don't know how many courses you took to get that 3.87. So it might be whether or not they want to count grad and it might be, did you get enough grad credit, credits for them to feel like that was a sustained trend? Um, mm -hmm. So sorry, Sam Gas, but the answer is it depends. Yeah. And great job. Yeah. That's an amazing turnaround. You are a different student today than you used to be. Mm -hmm. Tiffany, what are some good clinical experiences that do not require extra schooling like CNA or EMT? Um, <laughs> dep depends on what you mean by good, Tiffany, <laughs> right? CNA, EMT, phlebotomy are going to all require, depending on the mm -hmm. state you live in, being a medical assistant is going to require some sort of certification. Um, being any sort of like surgical tech or ER tech or um, uh, EKG tech is going to require some sort of training. Now, I don't know if schooling is any sort of training. It may be a three, four week course, right? Even being a scribe is going to require some training. Mm -hmm. yeah. So... I don't know, Tiffany. It sounds like you're asking a question of like, what's the, what's the easy way here? Yeah. Brittany, Brittany, well, what, what are your thoughts? I don't know. <laughs> no, I was just going to say that, um, yeah, no matter what you do, you're going to have to go through some kind of training. Um, even if you're volunteering, for instance, in a nursing home or hospice care or, or home being a home health attendant, they all require some sort of training. They're not just going to, you know, throw you in there, hope for the best. So um, maybe they meant like an actual certificate or something like that. I mean, you can look into things like potentially becoming a volunteer at one of these places, um, but you're going to need to do some some kind of training. 
What were yeah. you going to say, Rachel? Oh, um, I was going to say, I've done some Googling about this. And one of the things I've noticed when I Google um, clinical experiences and training is that the places that are spending the most ad money are places that offer associate's degrees. So don't be fooled by your top hits. Don't think, oh my gosh, I have to go get an associate's degree to be a CNA because that isn't necessarily the case. There are six and eight week or three and four week programs out there where you're getting a certificate. And often that's that's sufficient for those jobs. So just make sure, because I mean, like you said, Ryan, maybe it sounds like Tiffany's asking for the easy way out or maybe she like me saw hits at first that were like two years of schooling really like on top of the bachelor's i'm already getting like what and so just sort of beware of advertising that is telling you you need more than you do yeah no nothing should be another two years nothing nothing should be another year most of these things are like six weeks maybe <laughs> the most right. yeah. so mm -hmm. uh yeah Travon, as a current RN planning to apply to medical school in the summer of 24, how important is trying to get research and volunteer experience between finishing prereqs and parenthood? I don't have much time. This is such a common non-trad um, problem because they're busy, right? They're busy being parents. They're busy in whatever career they're in. Travon is lucky here that his job is a clinical job right and so uh, i'll read the the second part here the volunteer experience part I'll, I'll read that as volunteer clinical experience doesn't matter you're you're getting paid to get clinical experience keep getting paid to get clinical experience it's not more beneficial to you to get volunteer clinical experience so that's great uh if if you're talking about non-clinical volunteering like working at the soup kitchen or working for Habitat for Humanity, stuff like that. There are some schools that will want to see potentially some of that, but they may look at your full application and uh, go, hey, this this person's really busy with with other things in life, and, and that's okay. We'll, we'll give them a pass. Uh, research, as we've talked about already, is um, highly overrated. So if you, don't have, if you don't have time for it, don't worry about it. Indeed. Anything else to add, Rachel, Renia? I would just oh. I would just caution the the parenthood thing while we all know that is obviously a huge part of your life and it takes up a lot of time it's not something that it will excuse not having other things done but but as you said Ryan you, you're um, they're lucky because they do have a clinical job to rely on for some of that experience and to reflect on those experiences and, and talk about why you want to be a physician so just putting that out there being a parent unfortunately does not excuse you from needing to do certain things true arissa i'm thinking about taking about the mcat taking the mcat this june because i play college softball during the spring is this too late and might hurt my chances this cycle rachel mcat guru oh we're not supposed to use that word anymore uh mcat extraordinaire um mcat june uh it's getting a little bit later is yeah, it a it, nail in the coffin it, it's it doesn't kill your chances might it hurt your chances yeah Arisa, it, it might because if you're going to take it in june you're going to get your score back in july and we you didn't say when in june is it you know i don't remember the june dates off of my head, top of my head but is it june 2nd or june 29th but you're going to get your score about 30 35 days later and then that's when most med schools will start to actually consider your application. So if you've submitted your primary app, hopefully before, hopefully, hopefully part of your plan is even though you've got college softball during the spring, working on your application as much as you can this winter and doing MCAT prep this winter and spring. So you're still ramping all that up. You're not waiting till softball's over to do those things. Um, but so if you submit your application in late May, early June, you check the little box that says MCAT is coming this state, then what you can hope is that you'll still get secondaries on time. And that as soon as your MCAT is in and your secondaries are in, they start considering you. It's not ideal. 
Um, one of the big things we're always trying to teach people in their application cycle or people planning ahead is rolling admissions is part of the game. And the earlier you are in each stage of the cycle, um, the more it's going to help your chances just in terms of understanding that each med school gets thousands and thousands of applicants and tends to only have a few hundred interview seats. So you want to make sure you're getting looked at when they're giving away the interview seats. Um, MCAT in June is not the end of the world. Um, it just, it's not ideal. Like I'd, I'd be happier if you said, I'm going to try to take the MCAT in March before softball really ramps up. I don't know if you can be ready that soon, but then you would have the, the score in hand in April and it would be one less thing to worry about. Um, but you've got to make the choices that work for you. Yeah. Wait, I'm sorry. We're not supposed to use the word guru. Did I miss? <laughs> Did I miss <laughs> something? <laughs> we'll talk about that later. Okay. Yeah. I think it might be appropriating, right? I'm not. Okay. Yeah, like maybe I'm a guru in that life. I'm not. <laughs> <laughs> okay. <laughs> Tristan asks, what separates quality, memorable letters of recommendations versus those that are cookie cutter and easily forgotten? Awesome question and a great time to mention my LORs.com, our new letter of recommendation service that will be launching here in the next few weeks so that you can request, store, transmit all of your letters of recommendations um, at a similar, if not lower cost than other letter of recommendation services and you get to uh, have all of the awesome features of Mapped Row, including pre-med advising from us right inside of Mapped. Um, Verinia, a good letter of recommendation must do what? Convince the medical school that the individual that wrote it knows you really well, honestly. Knows you well enough to, to have written about your qualities, about your potential uh, as a future medical student, a future physician. So really what separates the two is the person who wrote it. So you want to make sure that who you reach out to is someone who can write a strong letter of recommendation for you because they've known you, they work with you, they can speak to those qualities. Um, there are resources online you can look up to see, um, like there's a guidelines for letter writers uh, that the AAMC puts out to help the letter writer get an understanding of what they're looking for, um, that what medical schools are looking for. So you could look into that. But really, who you ask is what's going to make or break it. So ask the professor that you know really well that you worked with, that you maybe did research with, or an, an employer. Um, don't ask, you know, the random coffee shop manager that only knows you, sees you once a month or whatever. It has to be someone that knows you really well. Yeah, this is not a case of the the professor for the class that you received an A in mm -hmm. or earned an A in is going to be better than one where you got a B. Um, yeah. if, if that professor where you got a lower grade knows you really well because you had to work really hard to get that lower grade, that, that's yeah. probably going to be a better letter. Yeah, I would add to that similarly, beware of title inflation. Mm -hmm. You know, like when I worked at a small test prep company, people often asked our CEO to write the letter because they thought, well, it'll look better if the CEO signs it. Mm -hmm. He didn't know those tutors. He never interacted mm -hmm. with them. He didn't have anything to say. Um, so think about who knows you and, you know, whether it's work or or school, who who really knows you well versus what letters are behind their name. Yep, yep. MBM18, hi, when should one start preparing their application and when should start preparing secondaries? Um, so the medical school application timeline, uh, if you had a free mapped account, you could just check out the roadmap and it would be all right there. The medical school applications open up every year in May. The ACOMIS application, if you're applying to DO schools, you can submit it right away. Uh, TMD SAS has a couple week delay. And then a Comus historically is about a month, uh, not a Comus, AMCAS is historically about a month delay, uh, end of May, beginning of June to be able to submit. And so applications open in May. You're going to need your primary, uh, your, your primary application stuff, your personal statement, your extracurricular activity descriptions, most meaningful activities if you're applying to AMCAS and TMDSAS. Um, you're going to need all of your letter of recommendations. You're going to need 
um, an MCAT score at some point that doesn't need to be done before you submit. Um, and you don't need your letters of recommendations before you submit either. But uh, it takes, I, I think, uh, what we typically see is that students overestimate uh, or underestimate rather how long it's going to take to properly write a personal statement. Yep. How long it's going to take to write the personal statement, to edit the personal statement, to rewrite the personal statement, to re-edit the personal statement, to get feedback from whoever they want to get feedback from. There, There's always um, a underestimation of, of how much time that's going to take. And then you want to be done ideally even before May so that you can start working on your secondaries because that tidal wave um, gets... Uh, pretty big uh, very quickly. And there are lots of essays that you're going to have to write with secondary essays. And so ideally, we always say start writing your personal statement in January. Uh, mm -hmm. Write it, put it away, come back to it, write some more, right? Uh, and then as soon as you can, start working on those secondary essays. Rachel, you got the timeline up there? Oh, yeah, I wanted to, well, there, where'd it go? Uh, there's all our pretty faces and the timeline. Yeah, when Ryan started answering this question, I was like, ah, I have a visual. It's not the world's prettiest visual, uh, but it is practical. I think, Verinia, actually, you wrote the original version of this, and I've just updated it once a year for the last couple of years. Um, you can see this process is very heavily front-loaded, right? So I think a lot of people, and I even heard one of our students or saw one of our students typed in, I'll be applying summer 2024 mm -hmm. or 2023. Um, whenever I hear summer, I rankle a little because I understand sometimes when people in college say summer, they mean like May 5th because they have finals late April. Um, but typically the SAGE applicant, if they're thinking about rolling admissions, is doing the bulk of the work the winter and the spring of the year they're going to apply. Mm -hmm. um, Secondary seems like a small item, but it's often 80 to 100 essays, depending on how many um, schools you're applying to. So um, getting all of that other work done January through April, like Ryan was saying, means you, you're you early in the rolling admissions for primary, and then you have time to pre-write secondaries before they actually arrive. Because, um, uh, you know, depending on how late you apply in the year, you won't actually be able to pre-write secondaries. Like, even if you're waiting for your primary to get verified, some med schools are going to just start automatically sending you secondaries anyway. Um, so again, this is an ideal timeline. If you don't follow this timeline exactly, could you still get in? Yeah, every year, people who aren't able to follow this timeline get in. I'm just saying, if you've got the time and space to set yourself up for success, this is the ideal plan. Mm -hmm. And this is the plan that if you look on the green side, the half side, you can see interviews can be anywhere from, from September and honestly, sometimes even August till March. Uh, waiting is hard, right? Getting those interviews in the fall is going to make you feel a lot better. <laughs> so to set yourself up for success if you can. Yep, yep, yep. William, I got a D in an intermediate algebra class, which is, which is not transferable to a four year from my community college. My advisor told me it will drop my BCPM GPA. What is your advice on this? Uh, yes, yes, it will. <laughs> your advisor is right. <laughs> <laughs> yes, yeah. your advisor knows the rules. All of your classes count. So, yeah. I, I'm not sure what advice you're looking for. Uh, if you retake the class, does it help? Sure. But so does taking any other class that affects your BCPM. So mm -hmm. if it's not a prereq, you don't have to retake it um, because a, a D is not passing for med school. But yeah, all classes count. And if it's a science class, which this is because it's math, and if you're applying to Texas, or AMCAS to TMDSAS or AMCAS, math counts as science. If you are applying to DO schools, math does not count as science. DO just considers BCP. They they don't they leave off the last M for uh, for the math. Um, so yeah, let us know what other advice you want here, William. Other than yeah, it's going to affect your uh, BCPM 
And it's nice that it seems like it happened earlier in your college career. And so you'll have time to fix your mistakes and uh, recover. Yep. Mm -hmm. See, I've only interviewed at one school so far, TMDSAS school, in-state resident. Should I start preparing to reapply for next cycle? Oh, Verenia, this is a, a, a hard one because Texas is different, right? They're yeah. in-state, which means mm -hmm. they're eligible for the match process, mm -hmm. which doesn't happen until next month. Yeah. Yeah. But I think it's still worth um, considering the idea of potentially applying reapplying. Absolutely. Now is the time to look back at your application and think, try to critically look at it and see what, you know, what could potentially be improved or what could potentially be um, written in a different way or expressed in a different way, potentially in the future, what activities you might need to um, consider maybe, you know, increasing your hours and things like that. I think it's always important no matter what, while there is still time, uh, it's worth your your time to go through your application. Yeah, absolutely. Definitely. Um, here is, um, let me share my screen real quick. Um, you can Google this. Uh, I think it's this one. Nope, it's not that one. Where is it? Dream art, dream art, dream art. There it is. Um, and then add to stream. Uh, if you Google TMDSAS match video, uh, the first thing that comes up, at least for me, is this video all about um, how the TMDSAS match works. And it's a really good explainer video from our friends at TMDSAS to explain how it works. If you are not a Texas resident, you are not eligible for the match process. But since C is, then they are eligible. So just something to to keep in mind there. Um, but it's a very convoluted kind of process um, that I, I don't know why they do it. They just do it because um, Texas wants to be different. But whatever, it works, supposedly. Uh, Naz. It. Uh, how do you how do experiences started in the year of the application cycle? How are they viewed by the admissions committee? Is it going to be too recent of an experience to make a difference in my app? Mm -hmm. Here's another one of those questions where it's like, what's the point of the question? And let's go ahead and answer it. Um, Rachel, if someone is lacking clinical experience and they can finally start doing clinical experience in February, March, April of the year that they're applying and they're hopefully planning on doing it throughout the application cycle, should they apply? Should they wait to apply the next cycle so they have a full year under their belt? What's 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 the advice there? Um, well, I don't think it's as cut and dry as a yes or no, right? Because it might depend on other experiences and any experiences that were maybe clinical adjacent. Um, so starting in the year you apply, and like Ryan said in this example, maybe you're starting this month, next month, March, means you'll at least have a couple months of getting that experience, probably before you apply in May or June. Um, now, we just talked about a few minutes ago, we think you should be working on essays January, February, March, April. So my concern with experiences started this year is you're going to have to have some meaningful, impactful experiences early on, which is a matter of luck, right? You're not in control of that. And then reflect on them and write essays right away. Because I think a lot of students make the mistake of thinking, I have to be able to point to these experiences. I have to list a certain number of dates or hours. Personally, I think that's less of a problem than your ability to have a great experience to tell that great story, right? So whether it's an experience that goes in your activities or an experience that shows up in your personal statement, um, you know, you're not going to have as much time to reflect on them or even to just gain those experiences. But yeah, if, if in this, and we don't have context, right? Maybe Nazra, what you're planning three years out, you know, and maybe you can fix this. But if you're applying this year and you don't have a certain experience yet that you think you need, yeah, go, go get it ASAP and do the best you can. 
if you're talking about when you say the year of the application cycle, you actually mean like kind of um, not the calendar year, but the school year, like, oh, I was going to start getting that experience in the summer. I don't know how that's going to help you. I mean, there is on AMCAS a place where you can list earned hours versus projected hours, but I don't know what your essay is going to be if you haven't done it yet. Um, so, so yeah, I, from the context, we can't tell if you need a time machine or if you're planning ahead. Uh, but either way, I think I go back to, um, what's that saying? The best time to plant a tree is 20 years ago. The second best time is today. Today, yep. Mm -hmm. That is the saying. <laughs> Adam G, I was waitlisted this cycle. Would it hurt me next cycle if I use the same personal statement and secondary responses? It could. Why risk it? You have grown as a person, I hope. So, yeah. Don't. Don't. <laughs> it, do you have to completely throw out uh, everything? No. Can you Can you massage and tweak yeah, I, I, it's never recommended to uh, just reuse. Yeah. Unless we're talking about single-use plastics. Reuse them as much as possible. <laughs> um, Daniel asks, I have a strong upward trend, but I could only raise to a 3.5. I'm planning to take two gap years to strengthen my app. What do you recommend me doing during the gap years? When is a post back a good option? Verinia, at some point, we stop caring about what that number looks like, and we care more about the trend. What, what, what's your advice here for Daniel? Yeah, sure. Um, so you say a strong upward trend, but of course, we don't really know what that looks like. Um, I think that in terms of your grades, it sounds like it might be okay. As far as strengthening your application during your gap years, I'd focus potentially on activities and things like that. When is a post back a, post back a good option? Again, that depends on your specific situation. It's hard to give you a definitive answer. There's no clear cut answer to this because we have to look at everything. Um, if you did really poorly in undergrad and now you've decided you're older now, you're more disciplined, you want to try this again, that's a good time for a post back. Or you're a, a career changer, that's a good option. Um, the post back is a good option in those situations. I don't know what your situation is in particular. So I would think that without knowing your, your specific academic record, um, if it's a strong upward trend, you're around a three, five, and that's, I don't know if that's cumulative science or what, um, look at it, look at both and focus on what can you do over the next two years that will allow you to explore the medical field and really understand what it means to be in that field and working with people. That's it. Yeah, it's, it's hard to answer questions. We, and we get this question all the time. What, what should I be doing in the, the, answer is well where are your weaknesses right <laughs> and that's what you should be working on is is focusing on those weaknesses if you don't have clinical get clinical if you don't have shadowing get some shadowing um and and if you don't have an upward trend start thinking about taking classes but if you do have an upward trend at some point we just ignore that 3.5 mm -hmm. and go okay your last 20 hours your last 30 hours your last 40 hours are a 3.8 a 3.9 and remember that medical schools can slice and dice your GPA and see all of those data points exactly as we present them in mapped and more. And so you, you have to stop. We have to stop focusing on, I have a 3.5. And this is what, what gets my blood boiling with SDN and Reddit and, and pre-med hangout everywhere where pre-meds hang out is they'll just focus on this final number and go, I have a 3.2, I have a 3.5, I have 3.7, I have a, I, whatever it is. And without seeing trends, it's impossible to go, well, that's that's fine. Because Daniel, your 3.5 might be completely fine because your last 40 credit hours are 3.9. If your 3.5, Daniel, was your last 40 credit hours are 3.2, and you you're you have a downward trend like that's not good so you're saying you have a strong upward trend what does that mean i don't know 
right? How are you defining a strong upward trend? Is it the same way that we define a strong upward trend? 30, 40, 50 credit hours at a really good GPA. So, yeah. Yep. I think what a lot of pre-meds forget is that your grades tell a story just as much as the rest of your application does. Yep. Your activities tell a story. Your personal statement tells a story. And by, and by story, I mean your experiences, your reflection, not not you know creative writing. So your grades tell the same thing. It's not just the number. It's how did you get there? What happened? How did you handle it? How did you overcome challenges, et cetera? Yeah. Yeah. And I mean, that's part of why we're always talking about map.com. I mean, it's free. There is a paid level, but the free level is really robust. The free level has the free GPA calculator. So it's not, it's not us selling. Like we're, mm -hmm. we've decided that every pre-med should have access to that tool for free. So we're saying, why describe your numbers in one sentence when you can take, you know, 45 minutes out of your life, do some data entry, pretty soon you won't even have to. Spoiler alert, cool, cool thing coming. Um, and we can do some real analysis with you. So um, you know, it, yeah. I think it's a great that people say, what should I do during my gap year? But the answer is always going to be address your weakness. And, you know, two sentences is just not enough for us to see a weakness. Yeah. Yep. Yep. Yeah. We, we have a, a friend in the space who posted something today saying, if you don't know your BCPM, are you really a pre-med? And I was like, well, a lot of people don't know what that means and they, they don't know how to calculate, but hey, mapped is free and you can do it. Perez, what do schools look at when deciding to give scholarships for medical students? I'm in non-trad working on a post back to boost GPA this year. Next year, plan on using for pre-med courses and MCAT. Um, so, yeah, scholarships. <laughs> the, the holy grail of medical school admissions is getting that scholarship package that financial aid package rachel um scholarships for medical school is very different than scholarships for undergrad yeah yeah so my first answer perez is they are sadly rare um and I, i'm not trying to discourage you i just want you to know the lay of the land um it's not as easy to get a scholarship as a med student than as than it is partly because with college scholarships, there are often multiple sources, right? There's like school-wide funding and then there's college-wise funding. And like, I know this varies school to school, but often there are endowments that get funneled through the school that are actually from third parties. Like for example, um, I just saw one recently where my mom's financial advisor, their group is funding a scholarship specifically for students at our local college who want to be financial planners, right? They're not saying, hey, you have to come work for me when 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 are done but it's like they they clearly have a motivation right so there's this niche stuff and that just is less likely to happen in med um but yeah what do they look for um i mean it's the same kinds of things they're looking for with with college students again just rare but they're looking for exceptional backgrounds and they're often looking for niches right so if for example you want to practice in uh rural medicine there might be rural medicine hospitals or even rural medicine private practices that are giving scholarships again in the hopes you know so sometimes you might actually sign a contract but more often it's just in the hopes that you're going to pay for it back to that same kind of group um so so the the easy answer i mean it's like a hard answer for you easier for me is it depends you need to go research like what do you have to offer and what's a fit and you may not know yet because when we apply to med school we don't always know what kind of doctor we want to be or where we practice but start thinking about those things and see if you can find a match that suits your particular niche of who you are and how you think you'll contribute to medicine. What is that name? I can't see it. Raul. <laughs> Raul. Um, I spend time learning and doing advocacy to prevent slash stop genocide and various atrocities. How would I talk about such a dark topic since it's part of who I am, but is real negative? I, I question why it has to be negative. The work that you're doing is very positive. Um, the thing that, that you're trying to prevent is, is obviously negative. Um, 
so I don't know, Verinia. I, I, I don't yeah. I don't see this as a negative thing. Like it sounds right. amazing this, what I, Raul's doing here. I agree. I wouldn't avoid it. I think you can potentially leave out some of the more um graphic details, I guess. You don't have to go into detail of some of the things maybe you've experienced or seen, but definitely talk about why sadly there's a need for people like you. Um, or, you know, for the programs that you're working on. That doesn't have to be negative. And you're right, Ryan, it's very positive. It's something you should include. And write about it in a way, though, that highlights the impact that it's had on you and the impact you've been able to make on others. Yeah, That's 100%. what I would focus on. Mm -hmm. yeah. That's great. Emily, I'm unsure what to do at this point. I graduated 20 years ago with a 2.0 GPA and 20 Fs. I went back to school for a post back and ended a 4.0 over the past 71 hours. MCAT 519. Do an SMP or apply. Apply. Woo! Emily, <laughs> what a comeback. Whew. Apply. Yeah. Yeah. So this this is the perfect example with enough details here, right? 4.0 over 71 hours and a 519 MCAT. Medical schools are not going to have concern about Emily's ability to do well in medical school because she has proven herself mm -hmm. academically. Yep. That's yeah. it, right? It's and it's not about the numbers, anything. it's can you handle the rigor of med school? And Emily is showing that she is a different student today than she was 20 years ago. 100%. Yep, and Will there be schools that will filter you out because you don't pass a specific level of an undergraduate GPA? Yes, there may be some schools that will filter you out. And that's okay. Yep. No, there, there will are. be some. Yeah. There'll be some that won't. So, exactly. Rock and roll, Emily. All right. We got four minutes. Maybe time for one more. Uno más. Sorcha, uh, I have a strong working relationship with a med student who is a leader at a school that I'm applying to, but a letter from them not weigh as much since they are still a third year medical student. Yeah, letters from medical students probably don't mm. need, don't want. It's probably more of a peer to peer versus a, um, a, a supervisor type relationship or physician type relationship. So uh, I would probably leave that off. Agreed. I agree. I know before I said ignore letters, but, but yeah, typically like ignore letters after names, you know, like, yeah. oh. but, but in this case, yeah, I, I, it, it verges on looking like a peer letter where typically letters of letters of recommendation are sometimes also called letters of evaluation. So it should be from someone who is in a position to evaluate you with some authority. Yeah. Yeah, that's, that's a good way of putting it because mm -hmm. that's exactly <laughs> the term that is used on AMCAS is the letter of evaluation. Mm -hmm. uh, we generically call them letters of recommendations, but uh, AMCAS, uh, at least AMCAS that I know of specifically says letters of evaluation. So uh, before we end, I want to remind everyone, premedworkshop.com slash interviews tonight at 9 p.m. Eastern, tomorrow at 1 p.m. Eastern, I'm putting on uh, what I think is a pretty fantastic workshop about the interview process and how to uh, crush it and just a different perspective to go into it with. And I've done this workshop for the last couple of years and students come out of the workshop kind of just lighter. <laughs> They're like, oh, this process isn't as scary as I thought it was. Uh, so come to the workshop register for it. The replay will be available for a, a short period of time as well. Uh, Application Academy, which is where if you want to hang out with me, uh, you get to hang out with all the amazing Medical School HQ advisors. Uh, but Application Academy is where I spend most of my time advising students these days. Uh, we start live on Monday, January 9th, next week. So, so exciting. Yeah, we're going to be twice a day every day it's 5.99 actually it's 4.99 right now if you go go sign up now the uh 
discount is is already attached there to the buttons um it's it's 10 hours a week with the advisors you don't have to come to every session every session is on a different topic so you kind of it's kind of a choose your own adventure style wherever you are at in the process we are there to help you um it is it, it has been a phenomenal success helping students get in to medical school so come hang out with us that's where i spend most of my time these days so, Brenia, Rachel, <laughs> thank you for hanging out. It was fun. It's Happy New Year, everyone. Great to see you Thanks. back. And uh, we'll see you hopefully at workshops tonight or tomorrow and Academy next week. Yeehaw. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.